Today, I have something a bit different for the channel. I have right here a book for babies about statistical physics. So if you're new to the channel, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Burdell, and I'm a physicist who specializes in statistical physics, particularly the quantum mechanical side of that coin. So this should be uh, real fun to look at. If you do like this book and you want to uh, buy it for your baby or a baby in your family, uh, I've left a link in the description for it. So now let's learn some statistical physics for babies. Okay, so let's open this right up. First off, this is a ball. It's interesting. And this ball is on the left. So it looks like we're going to partition ourselves into lefts and rights. I don't imagine they're going to treat this problem <laughs> continuously. I don't think we're going to get the, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution uh, for this problem for babies. It might be a little bit too advanced. Okay. So now this ball is on the move. It's moving to the right. And now it is on the right. One, two, three, four, five, six balls. These balls are on the move. So just a quick PSA, if you want, if you wanted to learn how to actually treat this problem, I do have a video on my channel uh, talking about non-interacting uh, uh, particles moving in a box just like this. You can get, uh, uh, for example, uh, the ideal gas law that you see uh, all the time with a, with a little bit of a quick calculation. So sometimes there are more on the left. Very atypical configuration, of course. So it looks like we're going for here. Our micro state is how many balls are on the left and how many balls are on the right. All these balls are sort of moving around, but we're not really accounting for that. And sometimes there are more on the right. And so another atypical configuration. So very rarely are they on the same side, which makes sense. You'd expect them to be distributed roughly evenly in space. We usually find them like this. If we have six balls and we're only tracking how many are on the left and how many are on the right, we would expect on average that this picture right here uh, would be the correct one or the correct one on average. Whenever we looked at the system, it would most likely be configured this way. So now each ball is a different color. So the key thing here, not for babies, but if you want to follow uh, the book as an adult and wonder why they introduced colors here, the reason for this is now the balls are distinguishable. Prior, the red balls on the previous pages were not distinguishable. Uh, which, which is interesting. It leads to different counting problems, and it means you have to treat the problem uh, differently. So there is only one way for all of the balls to be on the left. There are six ways for one ball to be on the right. So this is a very standard <laughs> counting problem. I don't know how appropriate the counting problem is for babies. It's a very nice and colorful, uh, uh, nice and colorful page, though. Um, so there's only six ways for one ball to be on the right, and that is, uh, if you're interested in this mathematically, this is a standard counting problem. All of these are distinguishable, uh, so uh, what you would use is uh, a combination. We would say this is six choose one ways, and that works out to six ways. And so there are 15 ways for two balls to be on the right. And so this is six choose two, because we have six balls and we're choosing two of them to be on the right hand side. And that turns out to be <laughs> 15 ways. So this is a very typical sort of uh, math problem that you would encounter um, you know, in an introductory uh, StatMet course. Um, very useful, in fact. There are 20 ways for three balls to be on each side. That is why we see this more often. So if we're just tracking left and right, just like this says, there are just way more ways for us to have three balls um, on each side rather than uh, two or one or zero. So this counting problem shows you that there are much more ways for the balls to be distributed evenly, right? Um, so 20 uh, versus 15 versus six. We've shown that if we're not going to put any restrictions on what these balls are doing, it's just more likely because there are more ways 
uh, to do it for there to be three balls on each side. So physicists call the number of different combinations entropy. And that's true. Entropy is really just a counting problem. It's a counting problem, uh, like we say here, these combinations, uh, because entropy can be calculated by calculating the number of so-called energetically accessible microstates. So every configuration we see in this book, if we have one ball on, uh, on the right-hand side on this page, these are all microstates. And usually when we do a problem like this, a configuration of particles or balls would also have an associated uh, energy that we could calculate. And so we usually expect a big system like this to have some type of fixed energy, maybe with a little bit of uncertainty, we don't know it exactly. And through that calculation, uh, you calculate uh, entropy with the number of um, accessible microstates, energetically accessible microstates, and that's, that's basically the whole problem of calculating entropy uh, for, a, uh, for a statistical physics problem. And so we see here uh, the author identifies low entropy with all of the particles just being on the left-hand side and high entropy being, you know, we're going to split them evenly between both sides. Now, if you wanted to learn more about entropy, I do have a video called What is Entropy? Sort of talking about it um, in an intuitive way and approaching it more, perhaps more rigorously than this, <laughs> than this baby's book. So if that's interesting to you, uh, it's definitely an easy video to follow. So check that out if you want. So even if all of the balls start on one side, they end up here with with three balls on either side because it is much more likely. And so when I at the beginning when I was saying that you know all the balls being on the left side being atypical that's because there are few ways to do that as this baby's book has taught us. Um, and when we go to a more um, typical configuration, um, I call it typical because there are just many more ways to organize your particles in such a way that three are on the left and three are on the right. Things move from low entropy to high entropy. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Now that might, that might seem uh, intimidating, the second law of thermodynamics. But all we're saying here, as we've communicated in this wonderful baby's book, is that it is very rare in a typical to have um, a state or a system in a configuration that has low entropy, especially one as simple um, as just balls bouncing around in a box. So it's very strange to have all of the balls on one side of the box and very naturally through physical motion, as you can probably, you know, just think to yourself about, you know, things bouncing around, hitting off of each other in this box. Over time, they will eventually flow to a state uh, with higher entropy because there are just more ways for the system to exist um, in a configuration with higher entropy. But in order to move from high entropy uh, to low entropy, you must add effort and energy. Now, this is also a usually true statement. So we can do a thought experiment. We can put we can start our system off with all of the particles in the box on the left-hand side. Now, quite quickly, we will flow to a state where we will have usually three particles on either side. Now, interestingly, if we wait long enough, eventually, the math tells us this, our particles will return arbitrarily close uh, to their initial conditions. So wherever they started, all on the left hand side. So things can flow to lower entropy, uh, but as you add in more particles, um, you can probably imagine six is a very small amount of particles. As you add in more and more and more particles, the time it takes for such a process uh, to occur gets pushed farther and farther and farther away in time. Uh, so we don't have to really worry about that for all intents and purposes. Things naturally go from organized to messy. So now you know statistical physics. I have to say, this was a splendid book. I wonder how engaging it would be for a baby. I imagine that's probably entirely up to the person reading it to the baby. Um, but like, honestly, 
it sort of covers all of these like intuitive topics that you would expect to cover more rigorously, of course, uh, at an undergraduate uh, level. And you'd, of course, be expected um, to be able to blow through a book like this very quickly. But it touches on sort of like the essentials of, you know, if you wanted to talk to your parents about what statistical mechanics is like, I mean, could you really do better than this? Is my video on the introduction to statistical mechanics um, better than this? I mean, probably not. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really like this. Um, so if there are more out there uh, that are like this, I might read um, some more. This was very clever. But that's it for today's video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this type of content, uh, be sure to leave a, a like, uh, feel free to subscribe, and leave a comment below.